I call this seminar the Jesus Frequency. But what I've learned for me, and some people learn, we learn things better, we grasp things better by looking sometimes at its opposite. Sometimes the law of contrast gets us to really get a better grasp of what, what, is some, what something is by looking at what it's not. And sometimes in your life experiences, you learn about something by first experiencing its opposite. And by experiencing its opposite, it prepares you to receive what is real. Now, in my life situation, I've kind of did the opposite. I, for, like, for example, in my personal career and progress, I, I was lucky early on. I found a vocation that really fulfilled me and called me at a very early age in comparison to most people. But then I, 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 I went the other way to find out this opposite. Only so I can go back and realize, okay, that was right. So sometimes we have to have this law of contrast so we can really, really, really learn and get things deep, deeply within us. And so even though this is called as Jesus frequency, we've been studying the past two, the past few Sundays on the Lucifer frequency, the Lucifer's frequency or the spirit of rebellion. So we're going to continue to do those contrasts to help us grasp what is a Jesus frequency. By recognizing the Lucifer frequency, you better grasp the Jesus frequency. All right, all aboard, or are you all bored? All right, so let's go back to the number one principle, the number one context to get the understanding of these frequencies and understanding why are we interested in the Jesus frequency, why we're in disinterested in Lucifer frequency, and why we're interested in spiritual growth. Progress is the watchword of the universe, the one and only principle that's based on this, my presentation. The major, the major foundational principle is that progress is the watchword of the universe. Evolution and progress is the ultimate operative imperative of the universe. Evolutionary progress is the goal of our life. And spiritual progress and attainment is the goal of eternity. The first commandment in the Bible to mankind, be fruitful and multiply. We see this operative everywhere, right? It's the reason why the sex urge is the strongest urge in the body. Because Earth is a biological organization that is wired unbiasedly towards reproduction and evolution. It does not care, right? So you take the sex urge in human bodies and the sex urge has been wired and programmed by whatever intelligence created us by the creator itself to make sure the species will evolve and mutate and reproduce. And so um, the sex urge in humans actually is stronger than the hunger urge. This is why if people in, in, in famine countries, they still will be reproducing even though they're famine and they don't have resources because earth is about a biological organization. It's about progress, about being fruitful, multiplying, increasing in numbers. And it gives us a reproductive urge for that. That is very, very difficult to suppress or to minimize. It's not meant to do that. You got to work with it intelligently. All right. And so in the same way we have the biological urge for reproduction and evolution, we also have a mental, a mental imperative to know, no, 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 to know more and no more and no more and no more and no more. And then to know even stuff that we don't think we need to know. This is why, as I always get the joke when I talk about human design, you're online, you're trying to do some work, and then you see that BuzzFeed find out where is little John now from the sitcom A Different Strokes? And you got to know it. You got to know or find out the 10 things that you're not doing right in your home. And you go read all these articles. Our mind is always just wanting to know more, 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 more. Uh, you can look over on Instagram, social media right now. Self-help and knowledge is just taking over because everyone wants just to know, no, 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 evolve, evolve, evolve. And then our soul is constantly craving more, more, more freedom, more expansion, more love, more morality, more moral, more uh, enlightenment. So everything in us, our mind, our body, our soul is, in, is seeking increase and in progress. Um, just to drive that point for the home, look at, think of the seed, you know, so uh, a, a seed, a little seed, you drop it to the ground and it produces more seed, life is multiplying. Every thought we think leads to need for more thought. Are you mean when you get up, you get one house, you need a bigger house. Um, you get one thought, you need another thought. Uh, you can't stop. You start loving a person and you can't stop loving them. You just want to love them even more. You find something beautiful and worthy and you just it just you need more stuff to love them with. So progress 
is the root, right? Just progress is driven in us. It's ingrained in our mind. It's ingrained in our body. It's ingrained in our soul. It is the watchword of the universe. All right, so let's, we, we, we got progress, which is one of the foundations of this, of this presentation. Now let's talk about frequency because this is called the Jesus Frequency Seminar. Nikola Tesla said, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So we understand that the watchword of the universe is progress, but now, well, how do we get progress? How do we experience progress, mind, body, and soul? How do we experience our evolution in alignment? Well, it's all about frequency. So let's break down energy, frequency, and vibration. These are, these are the new age, new thoughts, the new lingo of the world. Everybody's using these phrases, energy, frequency, vibration, in all ways, in all ways. So here's my little download of what energy, frequency, vibration is. Energy is a formless substance, right? A formless substance. And think of that as an example of, think of someone's or something's hitting nature, the constitution of their mind, a formless substance, a software. This is a software. Think of frequency as an aligning and controlling force. Uh, this is a spirit driving someone's formless substance. This is the, the frequency is the resonance, that which gives resonance and that which creates the, the, the formation of the formless substance. And then vibration is the final outpicturing or the material manifestation of that frequency, that which you can interact with. You can interact and feel my vibration and my vibration reveals to you what frequency I'm aligned with. Right, because you not you don't have access to my formless substance of my mind and my nature, but you can feel my vibration, which then reveals to you what is the frequency that I'm aligned with. So energy, frequency, and vibration. But we're talking about in this presentation, we're talking about the aligning and controlling force that which you are going to control your mind and your nature that is going to impact your vibration because the vibration is just the outer result of your frequency. We can't really focus on changing, raising your vibration. We raise your vibration by getting you to align with a different frequency. You raise your vibration when you make a mental decision to align and tune into a different frequency. Whatever frequency you tune into, there goes your vibration. All right, now here's where it gets a little woo, woo, woo. And a woo little woo woo woo. I don't know another word for it. All right. So let's talk about avatars of universe creators or possession of personality. Okay. Um, this is going to be a little complicated. This is a little new. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because I don't, it's not important whether we get it intellectually. I just wanted to bring it in here to maybe attempt to get us a little bit more context on frequency and personalities. The possession of personality. One of the lifelong age old debates when it comes to uh, the Gnostics, agnostics, the theologians, um, spirituality in all forms of fashion is, does deity possess personality? What that means is most individuals, most individuals can understand and grasp the idea of a supreme intelligence. There is some supreme design at work. There is some it factor that's created all of this. But the age old question is, can we assign personality interactive? Is there a personality associated with these in universal intelligence, with these operations that we observe happening? Can we assign it to personality? Does it have personality possession? And in the study of the book of Urantia, they go into a lot of deep talk about the personality assigning of deities, of supreme being. Or is it just a universal it? Is it just an intelligence governing us? Or is that it an actual personality that we can interact that we can call? Well, according in the revelation of the book of Urantia, you have a host of avatars of this universal supreme being this universal personality being. And the first one is what they, the first avatar is what they refer to as the only son. Don't get caught up on the language. These are our human, uh, the book of Urantia encourages us to understand 
that in our human finite mind, we can only relate to things in terms of our own understanding and language. The avatar is the, rep the, first, person the first personification of this, what they call the central force of the universe. So the first avatar or the first person personification of the central force of the universe is what the Book of Uranus refers to as the only son. They use that language as the only son. From that avatar, you get a local system ruler, a local system ruler or a universal, another being, which is about a ninth or 10th dimensional being, which was Lucifer. All right, Lucifer and actually Jesus all kind of range in this ninth dimensional being. These are actual personalities, energy personalities that it can interact with you in a personal way. And then when you drop down, you have even lower dimensional beings that are assigned to orchestrate administration affairs on each planet. Now, this sounds a little Star trek -y and woo-woo-woo, so we're not going to really focus on it. I just want to give a context of the Book of Urantia's teaching. And then according to them, L Lucifer is the system ruler who went into rebellion. And then we have our own a, a, a planetary administrator who was assigned to run Earth that also went into rebellion with Lucifer. And we call that being um, the devil. And we call the assistant to Lucifer saving. So the Urantia distinguished these three, these four uh, names and personalities from our historical mythology. And I'm just bringing them out to just get some distinguish. All right. So anyway, I just that's just some random intellectual for whoever needed to know, whoever was curious about the personification of these three or these four beings. All right, so it's all about avatars for the for the central force of the universe. Um, another good example to think about um, for those who need a visual understanding to not um, to not get caught up in this my drop down and then we'll leave it. Everyone familiar with the, what they call those rushing nesting dolls, where you have a big doll. And inside that big doll, inside that doll is another doll. And there's another doll. I had a picture of it on one of my presentations. Um, I think I'm calling it the right name. Does everyone know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand or shake your hand. Is, is anybody know the correct name for it? Is it called the rushing nesting dolls? Um, but anyway, you, you get the picture, right? You have that big doll, you open it up and there's another little one inside of it. That's what this drop down is. That's what this drop down is. So if you imagine the very first one is the avatar, the representation of this main central force of the universe. You open that one up, you have another one, right? Under that one, you have another one. Well, according to the book of Urantia, us humans, us humans, we are the 12th one. We're the last one and the lowest one. There's like 12 higher ones, 11 ones above us, and we are the lowest one. And they use the reference of, um, in, in the book of Urantia, I mean, in the from the, the Christian Bible, where Jesus said, um, you know, the book of Psalms call you are gods. What are, you created them a little lower. There's a verse that says, what is man that you are thoughtful of him? You created him a little lower than the angels. So the angels are right above us. And then it's us. And we're the lowest order. We're the lowest order of gods. So you always heard in different religions or different new age thoughts, you are God, you are God, you are God. Well, we are, but we're the lowest order of gods. We're the very lowest order of them. Um, and we have an invitation to ascend, to ascend spiritually, to progress up into the other dimensions. The gift of being who we are as a lower order, according to the book of Urantia, according to what I subscribe to, and according to what Jesus was teaching is, as being the lowest order, we have the gift to ascend all the way up in consciousness to, to the highest being, to understanding ourselves and realizing ourselves in the view of the 12th dimension. So we have, a, we have an invitation to be adopted into the, the, the ascension of the sons of God or eternal life. All right, I didn't mean to spend that much time on that, but I felt somebody in this, somebody here needed something, was curious about explaining that and getting that context. All right.
If you have a question, kind of take a note, put it in the chat box. I'm recording this to recast, so I'm going to keep teaching, but I do want to answer your questions because that's how I facilitate it. So as a question comes to you, put it in the chat box, and then for our question and answer, I'm going to address it. If any comment, anything that you feel, don't hold it in, put it in the chat box. We'll address it later. Okay, so now let's get to the Jesus frequency. So the Jesus frequency is this mind-controlling, transforming frequency impacting our nature, our biological nature, and our mind is transmutive. It's a mutative. I should have used that word mutative. It's a mutative frequency that reconstitutes our nature and our mind. And it's a living frequency on planet Earth. And it can be tapped into by anyone without any knowledge of Christianity. You don't have to know about Christianity. You don't have to be indoctrinated in Christianity to tap into the Jesus frequency and begin to have that fruit go in your life. But because of what happened in the Lucifer Rebellion and the Lucifer Frequency, there are two overarching competing frequencies running in our Earth, the Jesus Frequency and the Lucifer Frequency. The Lucifer Frequency, because it was the planetary's administration or the, the person or the, the ruler of the Earth who was assigned to Earth, the angel, the system, whatever you want to call it, the intelligence that was administrating Earth, because they went into alignment with the Lucifer frequency, the dominating home energy, the home energy of Earth is the Lucifer, is aligned with the Lucifer frequency. It's the home energy of Earth. So the home energy of Earth is naturally aligned with the Lucifer frequency. The Jesus frequency is a spirit of surrender to now truth. It's an inner surrender. It leads to inspired action. It leads to inspired action and it leads to a service to the spirit and cosmic progress. It's very spirit and cosmic progress oriented. Remember I said, progress is a watcher of the universe. So the end of these frequencies focuses still towards progress. The Lucifer frequency is a spirit of resistance to the now. It's an inner resistance that leads to an outer force. And it is, it is polarized to service to material progress and aggrandizement. It's this, it's this, it's this, it's, it's, the, it's the energy of the takers. It's the energy of the conquests, the conquistadors. It's the energy of, of, the, of, of, of us basically, the history of humans destroying the earth, right? Like when you think about the horrors of humanity, we literally destroy our home. Like, I mean, every, I mean, we are literally destroying earth. We will, we will just kill and kill. We are. Uh, one of my one of my teachers that I study, he calls humans killer monkeys. He says we are the most killing species on the planet historically. And when we get in groups, we kill. We say we need to go to war. We don't like the way those people think. Let's all rally together and kill some people. Let's drop a bomb. <laughs> right? Just think about the insanity of nuclear warfare. We're going to take these people out, harm the earth, eventually harm ourselves, but at least you're going to kill those people and kill them dead. So we are just some, some, so when we get into this, when we all get grouped into this frequency, we will kill, we will kill. We are killer monkeys uh, in this frequency for the sake of material progress. You feel like somebody's going to take something that we don't want them to take, or we want something that somebody doesn't have. And all the thing we know to do is to kill for the sake of getting, the sake of getting, um, and aggrandizement. Okay, keep the comments in the chats coming in so we can address them later. Y'all all aboard or you all bored? Okay, all right. Um, now, if I, I don't want anybody to get lost, so if you feel like you really have to interrupt me, rate, hit the raise the hand button. All right. So let's talk about that Jesus frequency versus the Lucifer frequency. Now let's go into the Buddha frequency because this comes up a lot. Is who is Buddha? Who is Jesus? Is is why are why am I not highlighting the Buddha frequency? Why am I not highlighting all the enlightened avatars that have been on the earth? And Dr. David R. Hawkins, another one of my favorite teachers, who wrote the book Power Versus Force and gave us the Law of Consciousness scale. He addressed his question, and I found a video that I thought was really, that was really um, great. 
how he addressed it, and I'm a, and I'll expound upon it. Very close, and I know that um, very y'all can all hear this. Can y'all all hear the video? Okay. So she basically, I'm gonna fast forward it, but she basically asked the difference between Judas and Buddha. Whether they can use both. In a different context, Christ was born. He never had a previous Jewish lifetime. Uh, his purpose is salvation. Somewhat like the representation of Buddha as the Balakasubara, the Buddha of infinite mercy of Lotus Land Buddhism. What Christ says is strive for unconditional love. And if you do so in my name, I will be your spokesman in the celestial realm, which in this world is called heaven. Hmm? The Buddha never had any previous lifetimes. No, I'm sorry. The Buddha had many previous lifetimes. It represents enlightenment. Enlightenment is a different ultimate objective from salvation. Yeah? Buddhism is also realistic that the likelihood of reaching enlightenment in this lifetime is extremely small. So you live uh, as good a life as you can and by karmic merit, you will land in the lotus land, which is a celestial realm in which the Buddha of the celestial realm will be your advocate as Christ is in Christian heaven. Therefore, the best thing to do is be a Buddhist Christian or a Christian Buddhist. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I think I, I, I got to go Whether back. One should really. Things. No, it's not two different things. There's the same thing, but. but uh, okay, I'm going to go back a little bit to a minute. Christ was born. He never had a previous two. Oh, no. we, we did that already. Uh, his purpose is salvation. Salvation. Yeah? Buddhism is also realistic that the likelihood of reaching enlightenment in this lifetime in this realm will be your advocate as Christ is in Christian heaven. Yeah? Therefore, the best thing to do is be a Buddhist Christian or a Christian Buddhist. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> the only difference is ecclesiastic doctrine. There's the teaching of Jesus Christ, and then there's the ecclesiastic doctrine of some church. Okay. The teacher is the teacher. The church is the church. Very often, people don't get into spirituality. They get into religionism. So watch out, the trap of religionism. <laughs> what you wear, whether you shave or don't shave, what you eat, sex, no sex is all irrelevant. And they get caught up in all that. At least you come here on the left side or the right side. <laughs> it's all irrelevant. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Now you've already got the core of it, or you wouldn't be asking. All right. So uh, to just expound upon that, well, he, 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 and there's another video also that I was just debating which one to play. But what he was saying is that Jesus, the frequency of Jesus, the Christ frequency, gets people is focused on salvation. And he articulated in other video, which I probably should have played, that most people, David Hawkins said, because most people are under the level 200, enlightenment for them and having the energy to seek enlightenment is not going to be attainable until they have some force that can get them out of that lower, that lower frequency. So they need salvation. Where he said the Buddha frequency is a frequency that helps reveal enlightenment, helps shows enlightenment by exposing exposing the resistance of a negative mind. It's a realistic, it's a practical exposure. It teaches you and shows you. But according to Hawkins, most of us calibrating below 200, the teachings of Buddha and the alignment of it is not gonna be enough to liberate us out of the lower traps of that frequency of resistance. So we need what he says in another video, a salvation. We need a way out. We need something to help us say, hey, give us a helping hand, get our frequency out of this, and then we can pursue the enlightenment path. All right. So um, I kind of wrote it over here. As you can see, it leads people out of the mind. And the Buddha frequency reveals the mind, it reveals the negativity of the mind. It reveals the truth of enlightenment. But revealing it to you and getting you out of it are two different things. 
okay? And I do consciousness calibrations and there's very few people calibrating over 200. And you have to have what Hawkins says, a lot of spiritual energy and you have to break free from that gravitational pull of the energy of resistance. In order to do that, you need another force to get you out of that. And that is the Jesus frequency, the, the aim of the Jesus frequency. Okay, so to follow Jesus' mission is the getting his frequency. But what does that frequency look like? What is the resonance of that frequency? Well, that frequency looks like this. If we had to summarize, if we had to summarize what that frequency is and does, we can read this from the book of Urantia. It says, of Jesus, it was truly said he trusted God. As a man among men, he most sublimely trusted the Father in heaven. He trusted his father as a little child trusts his earthly parent. His faith was perfect, but never presumptuous. No matter how cruel nature might appear to be or how indifferent to man's welfare on earth, Jesus never faltered in his faith. He was immune to disappointment and impervious to persecution. He was untouched by apparent failure. Jesus was an unusually cheerful person but he was not a blind and unreasoning optimist. His constant word of exhortation was be of good cheer. He could maintain his confident attitude because of his unswerving trust in God and his unshakable confidence in man. He was always touchingly considerate of all men because he loved them and believed in them. Still, he was always true to his convictions and magnificently firm in his devotion to doing of his father's will. So this is a synopsis of what that frequency does. It gives you this un, unadulterated faith in the personality deity of the universe. And that is going to what leads to our salvation. Because what happens is the appearance, the appearance of the world, the appearance of nature says, God is against us. If you go back and you go back in the book of Uranus and you study the origin of religion, the origin of religion came from early, early man seeing tornadoes, storms, hurricanes, whatever. Earth is violent. I don't got it. You know, Earth is violent. Bad luck. You know, somebody dying. They don't know how they die. And early man looked and said, oh, my gosh, something is punishing us. What is punishing us? We do it ourselves, right? We still do today. As soon as something goes off in our life, we say, am I being punished by God, right? Why is this happening to me? What did I do wrong? Is there an ancestor that's pissed? Is somebody pissed? You know, you hear people say all the time, how can there be a God and all this horrible thing is happening? So the first natural, the natural instinct of man to look at nature and be like, something is against us. We must have done something wrong which led to sacrifice, right? Every ancient culture has sacrifice because they would see something is off. There must be a deity that's unpleased. Let's kill somebody, right? Maybe they want a virgin. Maybe they want this goat. Maybe the ancestors want this. Let's kill them and give it to them so we can relieve ourselves of this issue. But Jesus frequency says, nope, no matter how cruel nature might be, I am not going to doubt that everything is going to be worth it. Everything's going to work out. I am going to, I am going to not change my faith. I'm not going to doubt the fact that the universe is friendly and supportive to me. This is a mantra that Wallace D. Waddles in the Science of Getting Rich said, you got to hold that. Every law of attraction teaches this now. You cannot hold the frequency that the universe is not friendly and supportive to you, despite the contrary appearances. And this is basically what Jesus' frequency attitude is. It makes you say, despite the negative BS happening around me, I am not doubting that the universe is friendly and supportive to me. And it gives you this idea of being of good cheer, having confidence in mankind, because you are so convicted of doing your father's will. So what's the father's will? Or I like to call it the creator's design. Now that I'm learning about human design, I love this term, the creator's design for you. So the G, it goes like this. This is what the spirit revealed to me. The Jesus frequency or the spirit of truth, it reveals to you the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ will reveal to you the creator design or in human design language, strategy and authority for your living. So it goes in this order. You get in touch with the frequency of Christ from the outside. 
that frequency reconstitutes your mind and it aligns you in the mind of Christ, as Paul says, and that mind of Christ then allows you to come in access with your own strategy and authority for living, whether you know human design or not. It will align you with your strategy and authority for living your best life, which is the Father's will, which your human mind cannot know. The Lucifer frequency, on the other hand, which is what I call how do we get ourselves in these hella situation, the Lucifer frequency or spirit of resistance, it blinds us. It blinds us to our strategy and our authority. It blinds us to the creator's design for us. And it aligns us into this resistance to now truth. And it, allow, it aligns us in this resistance to avoid and to move away from that which is going to be in the flow the flow of our of the father's will and it allow, we can't follow our strategy and authority and then it leaves us starving for satisfaction no matter what we do sobbing for success helpless for harmony and aching for adventure because we are so out of that that alignment that when these things will just come naturally to us um, and so you have the lucifer frequency and it, it's, it, it builds resistance, which is the most dangerous element to progress. Resistance is the most dangerous element to progress. Why is it the dangerous element to progress? It's interesting that when I get here, Trey Jackson just comes back on. Trey had a revelation one time. He was trying to explain it to me, and I thought it was so deep. And he said he had a vision of how we are moving. We are all moving. The earth is moving through space. The sun is moving through space. And we are in movement. Everything is moving, you all. We're moving, we're moving in space. Our bodies are moving, our spirits is moving. The earth is moving. Can you imagine what resistance does? Resistance says, I'm not gonna move. Do you know the harm and danger that you're doing to your body when life is moving you, everything is moving you in this direction and you're gonna say, no, I'm not gonna go. I don't wanna go, I don't wanna move. I'm gonna resist this movement. And so it takes you, you, you use your free will you take yourself a surgery and say, nope, I'm going to go this way. I'm not going to move. And it becomes a mass destruction on, big, on, 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 on a big level. And then it causes blindness because when you turn your back, you get blind and you just can't see. And the simple way to get in alignment with the truth, the Jesus frequency is simple. It is simple as just simple truth telling. This is why in the book of Revelation, it, ver it verbalizes or personifies the Jesus frequency by saying, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and hearkens unto me, I will come into him. It's just about telling the truth. This is why in the old, in the Christian doctrine, they say, confess your sins and call upon the name of the Lord. Confess your sins, confess, call. call. Truth telling opens you up. All you got to do is just tell the truth about yourself. And I, something happened, but I had this lies on here. Tell the truth to yourself about yourself. Tell yourself the truth about other people. Tell other people the truth about you. It's just constantly being brutally honest. The first step in the most, the Alcohol Anonymous 75 years has been one of the most transformative, most transformative groups on our, in, 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 in any culture. It doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody but they still have a high success rate for a lot of people. And the first principle is they gotta tell the truth. You gotta tell the truth. And so truth telling helps you up to the Jesus frequency. All right, we'll take a quick pause before we get into some work and I'm gonna address some questions. Woo, y'all y'all, um, <laughs> y'all went deep into it. Okay, let's go back to Monique's question. Where does God the Father come into this order? We are the very lowest orders of gods and we have an invitation to move up and ascend and conjure the highest being, but not the original creator God the Father, right? Yes, Nicole. So the Father is the name, it was the personification, is one, one of the many personifications that the central force of the universe is assigned to. The first call, some of it's called the controlling force of, this, of the universe, of universes. Some people say it's the, uh, another term is the central force the first cause and center, and we assign a name that from our human perspective, from, this is just from our human perspective, is the father. Just from our human perspective. 
as we observe it and experience it, as Paul says, our soul cries out, Abba, Father. But that is from our human perspective, right? It can be assigned a thousand names, right? But that central force in the universe is a big force that has an avatar. And we are ascending up. We are ascending, 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 where we will know ourselves in light of, uh, of, of the universe or the creator, where we will become one with the creator or ascend into sonship. All right, what is now truth? So now truth, did that answer your question, Monique? Kind of, sort of, okay. Your next question, Monique, you said, what is now truth or unlikelihood of being enlightened in this lifetime is all about free will, building muscles to change our vibration. Couldn't the higher powers just touch our frequency with a magic wand? Yes, but that would, that would interfere with our free will, but that would interfere with our progress. Remember last week we talked about the chick Remember how I gave the example of the chick that needed, it got, it's got to stretch its muscles. If you go and interfere and just open the egg up for the chick, it will weaken itself. It's not going to grow and be ready for the long-term career. So now truth is a word that was given to me. I don't know where I got it from. I don't know if I read it or it was a download. But now truth is when you're, there are facts that you need to face about your reality, facts from within and facts from without, right? Um, I think the first time, I was exposed to it. I was watching this video, this movie called The Peaceful Warrior. And, and in this, there's a scene where the mentor or the sage was talking to the college kid and the college kid was cocky. And he was like, and the mentor said, you know, something is off in your life. And he's like, what you mean something's off in my life? And I'm paraphrasing, I remember how it went. And he says, I, I'm, the, I'm, I'm the number one gymnastics. I do this. And he's like, and I only sleep alone when I want to. What you mean something's all my life? And then the mental him said, but are you happy? And he just paused and looked like, wait, are you eating my happy? And so a now truth is something like that, right? Where, yeah, you got this. Yeah, you got this. Yeah, you got this. But are you happy right now? Right? It's like that now truth is like, you know, we're like, oh, congratulations on so-and-so success. Oh, congratulations on this. Congrats. But the now truth is, is that correct for you? Are you happy? Is that the right thing for you? Did it make you feel good? What's the now truth? And so there is this resistance that is addictive. We see it all the time, right? And then every now and then we'll stop and we realize you, you, you hear this a lot when people be like, they find out that somebody's going through something, they find out something happened, like, damn, if I would have known that, I wouldn't have said that. Or damn, you don't ever know what people are going through. Or you hear these, you hear that expression all the time because people aren't looking at the now truth. We're not asking in the now truth. We're just like, oh, we're just looking at all this other stuff. And we're not saying what's happening right in the now truth. What's the facts that you're not facing right now? What's the facts inside yourself and the facts outside of yourself? Remember, we talked about Judas, which I'm about to get to. He could not deal with the facts of his reality in the now truth as they, as they brought themselves to you. Um, in the Gospel of Thomas, which is a very beautiful uh, scripture in the Gnostic tradition, there's a scripture in the Gnostic tradition attributed to Jesus. And it said, Jesus told his disciples, learn how to recognize what is in front of your face and what is hidden from you will be revealed to you. So things show up in our life, right? All the time, things are showing up. It's trying to reveal to us something's off, something's out of alignment, but we will ignore that now truth. All right, um, Nicole had a question, Danielle had a comment. Monique put, should we resist falsehood violence? Doesn't resistance have its place in some circumstances or there is a difference? Nicole, what do you mean by that? I mean, Monique, Monique. Well, I was going on the statement that you made earlier about resistance being the most dangerous element to progress. And I was thinking about that in terms of standing up, processing or things that are false or doing things that are yeah unjust. you know this is interesting so you know this is the basis of jesus non non-resistance non-violence teaching you know remember how he taught and I, and i'll go in it it's in the gospels and it's in the book of urantia this idea of he says if someone begs you to go one mile with them go three miles if someone begs you to someone try to take your cloak give them your tunic too so this idea of non-resistance right but there is a balance of, of where you have to stand your boundaries. But again, that's going to come, that, that is going to be moment by moment, situation by situation. But ultimately, the idea is, I'm not going to, re he says, don't resist an evil person. Right? 
Don't resist the evil person. Don't resist the evil. All right. Paul said this, you can't do, you can't do evil and expect good to come from it. So this idea of let that evil be, keep a boundary, don't let it interfere, you know, build your wall, but don't go over there trying to, as we hear in the secret DVD, we're not going to protest against this, right? We're not going to protest for peace or whatever. So wanna... go ahead, Monique. In my experience, if I tell the truth about something, just speaking truth sometimes would cause folks to have resistance to me. They Absolutely. Hear family. I don't know. Maybe resistance is not the right word. Um, no, it do. It do. If people people don't want the truth, baby, nobody wants the now truth. Nobody wants the now truth. So maybe that's not resistance. Maybe that's just speaking truth. You know, you you just you speak your truth and you let it go. You be out there. If it get resistance, get resistance. Got it. It's not about trying to prove a point. Now it's different trying to prove a point and, and, and trying to fight violently to get to to make somebody wrong, to make somebody change their behavior. But to just say, here's my truth as I see the facts. But I'm not gonna belittle you to make you to see the facts or make you wrong. There's a difference trying to make you wrong. I'm speaking my truth to make you wrong and get on my side. Can I say something to you? Yes. Okay, because I just had a conversation with my friend yesterday about truth. And what we discovered in a conversation was that speaking one's truth is necessary for you so that you're clear, so that you're not walking around holding any type of grudges, emotional baggage about, it's almost like it's just this, your truth is the, is, keeps you from not being backed up and walking in this world being backed up and holding all these extra thoughts and all the stuff and and in your i guess your energy your aura and it, like in that perspective it was just like wow because like adam was saying our society teaches us how we're supposed to be nice about things we're supposed to be polite we're supposed to and given you know we do we could say certain things um i guess you know nice or what have you but as long as we're expressing it and and not holding it with us so i just thought that that was um fascinating i was just mm. talking about that yesterday and, we're and trey, about i was just talking about that yesterday too with trey we had a whole big discussion almost the same thing oh my gosh we should all got together and talked about truth <laughs> Um, thank you. Anybody yeah, else? Anybody thing, else? One other thing really quickly. Sorry. What I, I say is that I don't want your niceness. I don't want your politeness. What I want is your truth. Like, don't worry about my feelings. Don't worry about my feelings because the, the thing that's most challenging and difficult I realize in life is that I can't do anything if I don't know the truth. Like things are always going to remain the same. And I'm, I'm putting this even in a context of relationships. Like if I'm in a relationship with somebody, um, you know, boyfriend or partnership, whatever like this, and they're just trying to be nice about stuff and they're not giving me their full truth because they might want to hurt, they think they're going to hurt my feelings or whatever. My feelings are for me to process. But like once that truth is out in the air and it even goes the same thing with your work situation. You don't want your boss, like, oh, well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want my boss to be like, oh, great job, good job. And then like two weeks later, I get fired. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, why'd you fire me? You're telling me good job up until this point. And then you just like, because you weren't giving me the truth. You were giving me your niceties. Okay, I'll stop. We just went in. We went in on all that yesterday, so <laughs> We did. But, but y'all, like, there's so many less people like Trayana than not, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like Trayana. I want the truth too. Like, don't front for me, you know what I'm saying? But like, we're like the one percent or something. Yeah, and I think that that's the way of Jesus. Like, I don't think Jesus was going around being nice to people. Like, it's like, it's kind of the cross you have to bear in some sense. Like, if you're like Jesus, if you're like Buddha, 
you could just simply say the truth, but know that people yeah. are going to be looking at you side eye, like, how dare, who is he? How is she going to be like this? And it's like, okay, well, I left what I needed back there and I'm going to continue my journey. I am not carrying residual of emotional stuff. <laughs> I just let go. Yeah. In that breakdown, when we was reading about the symmetry of Jesus, it said he was frank and candid, but kind. And he was always saying, if it, if it, he was like, if it was not so, would not have told you. But he was very, it was always saying he was very frank. And it said, it, he was so frank and candid, his enemies feared his presence. Because there was like this sense of like, you're going to get the truth. It'll be kind, but it's going to be the truth. He says, I, he's literally, I am the way, the truth, the light. And it's, that's why in that symmetry, it says he, he lived the truth, he preached the truth, he was for the truth. And, and let's, so let's transition. Oh, Monique, would you want to say something before we go into this? I'm good, but that's, I am thinking about Jesus turning over those tables in the temple. Yeah. That's yeah. the Jesus I think of. I think he was extremely revolutionary. Yeah. Well, he was revolutionary, but in that, in that context, in the context, what happened was, so let me give that context, because a lot of people use it all the time. There was a rule. There was a rule that that was not supposed to be happening. Right, there was a rule that was supposed to be happening. There was went into there was this agreed consent over time to let these money changing these sellers, these vendors, set up shop outside the temple. And in the book of Urantia, the book of Urantia went into great detail about what happened. Jesus had witnessed do some work. This is so deep, y'all. I give it to you. Jesus had witnessed in a previous journey in his life a poor village. That him and his father was doing some work with. These were very poor people, like very poor people. Jesus was happened to witness this same group of people that him and his father had this ministry to do some work for. Years later, the same population of people who were very poor had came to Jerusalem to do their offering. And Jesus saw what was happening was these people were really under this 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 blindness of they have to give their very, very best to get their forgiveness, to give. And what happened was he saw that these people were being economically raped and manipulated. And it says when he stopped and he saw what was happening and he knew that this was, a, this was something that even the Jews knew was not allowed. But over time, it had become one of those things like, oh, we'll just let this person come up. Oh, we'll let this person set up shop. And then it says when he looked, in the book you ran to on the day, it says he looked like in slow motion. He saw these animals being kept in these cages. He saw these people being oppressed with their last coins. It said it just, it, he would just, he would just overcome and was just like, stop it. And they could not do anything because it was already the law for them not to have it. Everyone, everyone had went into a group think, a group consensual. So that's why they did, they dare not touch it. It's already like, yeah, we knew we were doing it anyway, but no one had ever, no one had ever said, this is not fair. This is not right. Um, okay, so let's talk about, you got to go read, y'all got to read that part. It would bring tears to your eyes, how they really illustrate, break down what, what the, everything that led to that, that zealous moment by him. But the basis was he did not disrupt something. He disrupted something that everyone knew was not supposed to be happening anyway. But they just kind of everyone had just got quietly going along with it. But when he saw the oppression of like people giving their last, it was it was too, it said it was too much for him. And they were doing it thinking those people were doing it thinking this is what God wants them to do. And when it, when he saw in their minds they thought they're doing something that they think is God and it's all man, he's like, oh, had enough. Nope, nope, not not not, not standing for this. Um, all right, so let's talk about, let's go back to Judas. Um, let's go back to Judas. All right, the spirit of resistance at work. Let's talk about what that spirit of resistance looks like. Let's get more illustration about a person that's not in the now truth. Let's get more, let's, let, let's look at this in contrast of Jesus and his faith, his faith and his ability Let's look at it again at word. Let's break it down. 
Jesus, it says Judas was ultra, highly individualistic and chose to grow into a shut in and unsociable sort of person. Remember, in the book of Genesis, that's not good for man to be alone. Right? In the book of Urantia, when you start reading about the story of Jesus, he's constantly warning his disciples, be very, very weary of being by yourselves. Right? Um, check this out, you all. Even in human design, I read in human design, there's this PDF I found from my human design library. The founder, Raw, has this book about entities, demons, possess, all this crazy stuff. And he said in his book, he says, entities, spirits, they wait for humans to get alone. He said, in his, he, he, Raw said, they wait for humans to get alone. He says, they, they can't, it's hard, for, it's hard for these entities, negative energies to influence the person until they become alone. Unsociability is really, really dangerous. Right. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of therapists, a lot of people complaining about this, the shut in and the quarantine because they understood this is not healthy for some, a lot of human, a lot of human beings. So we see that one of the things that makes us resistance is it makes us shut out ourselves. It makes us not want to deal with people. It makes us not want to be. All right. It also says this as a child, it said life had been made too easy for him. Now, what does that mean? And it said he bitterly resented thwarting. He always expected to win. Now, this is what this is what a lot of, of, of new kind of liberal uh, revolutionary thinkers are saying about uh, our generation, especially my generation. We come from a generation where we all everyone has to win. We're not going to have a loser. Everyone gets a reward. Everyone is special. Everyone can do whatever they want to do. You can be what you want to be. But there's this idea of you've got to learn early that life is going to be disappointing for you, right? I remember, I remember one time I, I observed a father doing something to his, doing something and he says to his child, I don't want them to be spoiled. And I said, well, I think life is gonna make sure they don't, they're not spoiled. Uh, and this person was an extreme. But then I remember another person, I overstepped the boundary and they, and they, were, a, they were a single father and they said, they say, oh, they're going to go spend time with their son the weekend. I said, what are y'all going to do? They said, we, I do whatever my son wants. I do whatever he wants, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I, and I, in, in, in my era, in my era, I said, that sounds a quick, that sounds, a, that sounds like a quick, a quick, sure recipe for, for, to ruin him. Ooh, that, that, that father let me have it. And I was, I was at my, I didn't have any children, but what I was observing, what I can see in my own self, when we don't learn early, a no, when you don't learn no early, when you don't learn early in life that our a no is not going to be the end of us, right? That we, our parents can say no, we cry, but we can win tomorrow. If you don't get that early, later on in life, you, it, when you get a no at 40, at 30, that no is devastating. And when you can't get your way later on, it is devastating to you. So, um, the book you ran shit really goes into this idea is children, children got to learn very early that they can't have everything go their way. It gives them, it, 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 when they do, it gives a very false, it gives a very false, unrealistic reality of how life is going to respond to them. And it makes it very hard for them later to deal with disappointment and deal with anybody, anything that's going to, that seems to get this in their way from getting them what they want. Um, and so it said, because he was the only child and his parents made it too easy for him, he, he could not lose. He just, he, he could not lose. It was, it was unshakable to him to not get his way or to not get what he wanted. All right. Um, somebody is, somebody needs to be muted. So just unmute yourselves when y'all want to talk. Um, it also said he never acquired a, phil a philosophic technique for meeting disappointment. Instead of accepting disappointments as a regular, commonplace feature of human existence, he unfailingly resorted to the practice of blaming um, someone in particular, his associates, his group, for all his personal difficulties and disappointments. So once again, early on in life, as a child, one of the educations that our parents are here to teach, and what you're here to teach your children is, you're here to teach your children disappointment is an Inevitable. You're supposed to get a, we're supposed to get a, we're supposed to get early five, six, seven, eight, 
bad things are going to happen. And this is how you resolve your mind and get over it. This is how you learn to keep it moving. Let me tell y'all some people who did it. Them ancestors of ours. Those, those ancestors grew up in the South, right? Them grandmas of ours and those grandfathers of ours that grew up in that, that grew up in that slave culture, oppressive South, them jokers, they were resilient beyond what you can imagine. They were losing children, they were losing spouses, they were losing land, they were being oppressed, they were being kept from, but they kept it moving. They had something that they developed early on. You don't get stopped, you don't blame nobody. You keep it moving, you keep it moving. I mean, and they really, they were forced to develop a technique, whatever you want to call it, um, whatever they had, whether it was Jesus, whether it was whatever they, they, they had. I mean, they, they were some strong, our ancestors, especially those in the South, they had to develop a philosophy of keeping it moving, keeping it moving, right? They did not stop to blame anybody. They kept it moving. I mean, you hear the stories of your grandma and them and grandfather them from the South, I mean, they could have stopped and blamed a thousand people, but they would keep it moving. And you sometimes say, man, they never told this story about so-and-so. I never heard that story of so-and-so. I didn't know that this person had it that bad. I didn't know so-and-so was, 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 cause they kept it moving. They didn't stop to, to say, my, my mama never gave me this, my whatever it is, whatever it is. They just, they just had this philosophy of we gonna keep it moving, all right? And so we, we have to develop this early or else every little disappointment we want to blame this person. We want to blame that. We want to say this is the problem. And we get stuck in that, which leads us to holding grudges and then getting lost in the idea of entertaining revenge, of just holding on to revenge, right? And that is going to disappoint you because when you get suckered in to hold revenge, entertain revenge, when you get suckered into that, um, when you get suckered into that idea of revenge, what happens is you, you lose the alignment of following the spirit because the spirit may lead you somewhere where it looks like you're going to be the very opposite of revenge. It looks like you're going to be further humiliated. All right. And then once again, we see that we see that Jesus, Judas did not like to face facts, frankly. He was dishonest in his attitude towards life situations. So once again, we see that dishonest, that not being truthful in the now moment. He disliked to discuss his personal problems with the media associates. He refused to talk over his difficulties with his real friends who truly loved him. Uh, he never went, he said he never went to Jesus. Uh, he never learned that the real rewards, now this is a really big one. This is what the spirit of resistance does. Um, and then it's the last one we're gonna go on. It says, he never learned the real rewards, he never learned the real rewards for noble living are spiritual prizes, which are not always distributed during this one short life in the flesh. This is where I see myself and so many people get lost. We are so thinking, if I do this, if I live like this, it's going to lead to this great, abundant, magical, beautiful, rewarding life right here, right now. And we're not, our mind, our, our, we're, we lose our spiritual blindness to realizing we may not get every single thing that's due to us in this one short life. But we still got to do good. We still got to make corrections. It goes back to the great leaders. Moses never entered into the promised land. Martin Luther King didn't get to live to realize his dream. All right. And so, 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 far, so some of us, we may not get all the prizes and everything that we're living so hard for. And if we're blind to that, it's going to make us very, very disappointed. It's going to make us very, it's going to make living very hard because we're going to be like, my God, I've been doing all this. I don't see the fruit of it. And I'm about to die now. My, where, where's my life been? And we may, it make, it'll make us want to try to help and do something. Do something to get some type of reward now. Instead of just trusting that I'll be rewarded in the future. Some hey, earth is not it. Earth is not it. This is not it for us. This is not it for us. Just like high school was not it for us. Just like college was not it for us. Even though people might have said, I remember in ninth grade, a teacher said, these are going to be the best years of your life. I was in ninth grade. I never forget she said that. She says, high school is going to be the best years of your life. I said, I rebuke that. I, I said, Lord, no, it can't be true. 
And I was afraid to leave college. I thought college, it won't get no better for college. Life keeps getting better. There's so much more. This is just not it. Um, all right. So let me go back to some questions. All right. So, um, doop, 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 doop. Monique, you were explaining about a shadow of experience, and then Danielle was saying something. What were you, what what's y'all questions? What y'all just in discussing? Yeah, I was asking uh, based on your listing of Jesus's spirit of resistance at work. Um, all of, every human being has experienced all of these traits. Like it's a natural part of human existence. Yes. The struggle to, you know, go to the light versus our shadow side. Um, and this is presented as a caricature of all of the bad traits of this person. So I guess I was just trying to understand, um, isn't that a normal thing? It is. And I'm so glad you asked that because today for our reading, we're going to read another apostle because there's other apostles and other, because this is so human, this is so natural, right? So this was, this was more so again, remember I said the home energy, the home energy of earth, the home energy of humans is this frequency. Mm -hmm. This is the home energy. But what they were saying was they were saying what fed it and what locked it in. What, this, these are some situations that locked it in. So here, here's a person intimately, intimately interacting with the frequency of Jesus in the human flesh, interacting, interacting with it, but yet not able to overcome. Not able to be transformed by it. And so it made it, 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 it he was able to overcome it and transform it. And so that is what, um, so that is what, what uh, let me, let's see if I, we can, let's see if we can pull it up. Because they go here in it. Let me see. Hold on. Right here. So it says, you know, it, it's more so about how they said he, it was a refusal to grow. You can read it right here. Um. It's right here. This unfortunate combination of individual peculiarities and mental, mental tendencies conspired to destroy a well-intentioned man who failed to subdue these evil by love, faith, and trust. So what it is, is you're right. We all have these. We all have these, right? It just They're just saying, here's a combination. And it says here, Judas need not have gone wrong was proved by Thomas Nathaniel both who they say had the same tendencies, right? And it says even Andrew and Matthew had these leanings. But it said, but all these men grew to love Jesus and their fellow apostles more and not less as time passed. They grew in grace and in a knowledge of the truth. They became increasingly more trustful. So yes, it doesn't mean we all have them, but we can subdue, we can subdue these as they come along. And then it says, down here it says, we see that it says that, um, it says, uh, da, 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 da. where did I go? It says, um, it says, it says, it says uh, as a result, I mean, here you see, these are the factors of influence which all together take a person out. What do they define as evil? Evil is anything that goes backwards from progress. They gave it very, very simple. Evil is life spelled backwards. So anything that's not moving in the movement, anything that's not going towards progress is how they describe evil. Evil is that which is going backwards from progress, that which is denying truth. Okay. So we see, let's see another person who was struggling with the same thing. Um, you don't read about him a lot in the regular Bible, but you hear about him a little bit. His name was Simon the Zealot. We're gonna read about him today. To me, it's a very beautiful story, but it's kind of sad. So si Simon, and again, I'm just gonna read over it and y'all can just sit back and listen. 
like we did it last time. So just enjoy, enjoy me, enjoy the reading of it, okay? So this is Simon the Zealot. He was very, he's another one that was very plagued with a lot of blindness, a lot of good intentions. And it shows us it. Let's say, so Simon Zealot, he was the 11th apostle. He was chosen by Simon Peter. He was an able man of good ancestry and lived with his family at Capernaum. He was 28 years old when he became attached to the apostles. He was a fiery agitator. Um, hold on, hold on. Ooh. And also was a man who spoke much without thinking. He had been a merchant in Capernaum before he turned his entire attention to the patriotic organization of the Zealots. Simon Zealot was given charge of the diversions and the relaxation of the apostolic group. He was a very efficient organizer of the play life and recre recre recreational activities of the 12. Simon's strength was his inspirational loyalty. When the apostles found a man in Roman who floundered in decision about entering the kingdom, they would send for Simon. It usually required only about 15 minutes for this enthusiastic advocate of salvation through faith in God to settle all their doubts and remove all indecision and to see a soul born into the liberty and faith of salvation. Simon's great weakness was his material mindedness. He could not quickly change himself from a Jewish nationalist to a spiritually minded internationalist. Four years was too short a time in which to make such an intellectual and emotional transformation. But Jesus was always patient with him. The one thing about Jesus, which Simon so much admired, was the master's calmness, his assurance, his poise, and his inexplicable composure. Although Simon was a rabid revolutionist, a fearless firebrand of agitation, he gradually subdued his fiery nature until he became a powerful and effective preacher of peace on earth and goodwill among men. Simon was a great debater. He did like to argue. And when it came to dealing with the legalistic minds of the educated Jews or the intellectual quibblings of the Greeks, the task was always assigned to Simon. He was a rebel by nature and an iconoclast by training, but Jesus won him for the higher concepts of the kingdom of heaven. He had always identified himself with the party of protest, but he now joined the party of progress, unlimited and eternal progression of spirit and truth. Simon was a man of intense loyalties and warm personal devotions, and he did profoundly love Jesus. Jesus was not afraid to identify himself with businessmen, laboring men, optimists, pessimists, philosophers, skeptics, publicans, politicians, patriots. He loved them all. The master had many talks with Simon, but he never fully succeeded in making an internationalist out of this ardent Jewish nationalist. Jesus often told Simon that it was proper to want to see social, economic, and political orders improved, but he would always add, that is not the business of the kingdom of heaven. We must be dedicated to doing the Father's will. Our business is to be ambassadors of a spiritual government on high, and we must not immediately concern ourselves with aught but the representation of the will and character of the divine Father who stands at the head of the government, whose credentials we bear. It was all difficult for Simon to comprehend, but gradually he began to grasp something of the, something of the meaning of the master's teaching. After, wait, wait, wait. After, after the dispersion, because of the Jerusalem persecutions, Simon went into temporary retirement. He was literally crushed. As a nationalist patriot, he has surrendered indifference to Jesus' teachings. Now all was lost. He was in despair, but in a few years, he rallied his hopes and went forth to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. So in, in case y'all didn't miss that, that after Jesus left and, and the Jews, the persecution started to happen, it said that he actually gave in um, he, he, he gave in, he gave, he surrendered, he did not go with Jesus' teachings. He, he stayed a patriot. And when, 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 the, when the Jews lost, he basically, he was in despair. And it said, but, but, but in a few years, he rallied his hopes and went forth to proclaim the gospel. He went to Alexandria 
And after working up the Nile, he penetrated to the heart of Africa, everywhere preaching the gospel of Jesus and baptizing believers. Thus he labored until he was an old man and feeble, and he died and was buried in the heart of Africa. So look at this transformation. Here is this national ardent Jewish nationalist about the improvement and the and the and the, and the and, uh, as zealous he was an organizer of a of a protested movement almost equal to like all Jews matter, but yet he ended up getting himself transformed so much he ended up living and preaching as an internationalist in Africa, but he did it it was difficult it took some time but he was able to surrender and give into the new teaching and the new kingdom, and I felt that as a, a very beautiful. A very beautiful story. All right. Daniel, why'd you I, I roll? All right. Feedback, comments. Where are we at, everybody, with this story of listening to Zion, Simon's story versus Judah's story? So my I roll is I just I just have a little trouble with is this a Eurasian story? Yeah. And I don't know, maybe I'm just in a really pro-black mode, but I feel like whoever wrote Urantia was probably white skinned and Simon is black. And of course, he's not supposed to be about social justice because that would change the status quo. So it just seems really convenient. And that's, I guess I'm, I need a little prayer because that just seems a little disturbing to me that you're supposed to be an ambassador, but then you're supposed to not involve yourself in social justice and things that people are are fighting, whether it's the environment or whether it's Black Lives well, Matter. I don't think, well, 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 here's one thing, Danielle. You, I'm reading. I'm reading a fragment, right? So this is this is one. This is a mini mini excerpt from a large large book. So you would have to really read this the story from the beginning. And so Jesus actually was very much on social reformation. He was in, 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 in the book, the book he ran really goes into detail and explain the context. But when it came to his apostles, he was very clear to them, to them, he was calling them to represent a spiritual thing. Also, the book you ran, the book you ran, she goes on to say, Jesus had a lot of foresight that he knew the evil of roaming of the Roman world and the Roman workings. And so he also was trying to give this understanding of there is, if you try to re protest the Romans and their government and their armies, that he knew how ruthless they were. So it said Jesus had this understanding. He also was trying to discourage them. Look, we might be on a losing war, all right? Do not seek to really work this guilt into war with these, to, with these Romans and do these rebellions. It's better to go around this, to just do the spiritual, do it piece by piece. And so as we, as history knows, Jesus was right. The Romans came in and they pretty much just destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, destroyed everything. And that's what they were saying that that crushed Simon so much because he, he pretty much did not take heed. He still became a, a nationalist to work out the, the, the improvement or the resurrection of the Jewish nation. And they did not, they weren't successful against the Roman empire which Jesus was given a foresight. Um, and so as a result, so you got to go back. So he wasn't discouraging it, but he was discouraging it for his, what he said, for just his apostles, just for his apostles. Jesus' idea was that his apostles were supposed to use their spiritual inspiration to then inspire the post, the people who were going to do the political revolutions, the political, the economic readjustments. So the book of Ranchi says it's the, it's the spiritual apostles who then were supposed to inspire those individuals who were going to lead it. So this is just one expert, and this is, this is very personal to Simon and, and the apostle. So Adam, in essence, like, are you saying that not, it's not so much that that didn't need to happen, that just wasn't Simon's task? It wasn't what it wasn't what Jesus was calling him for in his in his mission and to right. align it with his mission. So he kind of like wait. Jesus was trying to keep him from like wasting time on what he was really supposed yeah, to be doing. The book of Matthew goes into a deep insight. He, Jesus had an insight. He knew that what some they couldn't see the bigger picture of. They really were fancying this idea. We're going to arrive at protest. We're going to overthrow these Romans and we're going to get them out of our country and nation. Jesus knew the foresight. He knew the scope. 
the, mag the magnitude of the Roman Empire, the mercilessness, the ruthlessness of their schemes. And so he was like, here's, a, here's another way what we can settle to right now. So it's all about different contexts. That was for then. So it's, it's in the Bookie Ranch is very clear on saying each generation, each generation, each person, each mission is different. It is, you can't, we can't ascribe to what happened for Simon, but what we can see is that I was using this as an example to see here was a person who's also locked in on this right now. They wanted, they wanted the re the, the reimmersion of the Jewish national nation army. They wanted what Jesus was promising. They could not, and you go back and read it, you'll see they could not distinguish in Jesus way the kingdom of God. They could not, some of them, and Simon was one of them. He could not distinguish that kingdom from being a material kingdom that they were going to usher in here and now, like in his lifetime. He could not, he could not separate that. And Judas couldn't either. You'll see in the story, Judas couldn't either. But but Judas, his was utter, he utterly fell. When he realized it wasn't going to happen, it, it devastated him. And he went into even more resentment because he felt like he got played by Jesus. But here's the story of a person who did kind of feel play, but they got themselves together. He got over his disappointment and he went on to become a great, a great preacher. Uh, Monique, uh, explain your question. I don't know if I can, Adam. <laughs> you said, isn't the fate progress our physically manifest earth linked to spiritual progress working out? Well, so that part was linked to this, the quote that I just heard you read about Jesus telling Simon that he should be thinking more about spiritual things, right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the kingdom of heaven versus the riots against the Romans, um, which is so apropos to what we are going through right now, I think as African-Americans, which is why I can relate to Danielle's comment. Cause I struggle with that too. The spiritual side of me thinking about spiritual ascension and then this physical side of me thinking about working it out right here on earth. So I think that um, my question really speaks to, um, isn't the work we do here on earth working with each other, uh, changing society, linked to our spiritual progress and ascension? Well, it's a byproduct of it. It's a byproduct of it, right? So there are certain things that, for me, what I've been shown is that, and I've been blessed. I feel, I mean, the other day I was working with, a, um, I work with politicians now. Uh, it's something I feel very blessed and very honored to do. So I represent spiritual values. I, I, have, I have a love and passion for economic progress and change. But I now, God has blessed me to be able to pour spiritually into people who are really actually making those frontline decisions. So I focus on the kingdom, their job, their call to make political corrections, to, to rally in the, on behalf of the other people. Now, but, but my mission, my purpose is to represent the father, to preach the spiritual truth, and then inspire those individuals to, to make decisions on these higher values and concepts. Now, when it comes to what our, everyone, everybody has a different call. It's you gotta ask yourself, what am I called to be? Am I called to put my energy and focus into politics, into organization, into social justice? Am I gonna be a statesman, a judge, a lawyer? And so you gotta understand how you're called and then you take that Jesus frequency and you put it in alignment in where you're at. But there's no, but the, the idea is we're supposed to act in our calling without attachment to the outcome. Because remember I said earlier, we don't know what's gonna happen. Martin Luther King did not get to live his dream, right? Gandhi got assassinated in, in, in pursuing his. The idea is you do what comes in response to. Martin Luther King responded to being that leader, it got him assassinated. So we don't know always the outcome of things. The idea is if you follow your, the spirit, whatever the father's will may be for you, your, the father may be for you to get out there and advocate for social justice, right? And I don't know that. I can't judge what masters, I can't judge it. All Jesus was saying is, I called you on my team to represent the father. Got that's it. what my, that's what my team, this is what my mission of my team is. So whatever you do, you just need to infuse that spiritual focus. Absolutely, you just need to be aligned in that frequency, you know? <laughs> And it's not, again, it, he, Jesus was not saying this is for all Christians, because as we see throughout time, there's been a lot of spirit. Look, again, Martin Luther King is the perfect example. He was a minister, right? 
who was just focusing on preaching and teaching the gospel. And then he, when he responded to the call, his call was now rally up in 1960. We needed someone to now stand up and be social justice. And that's how Christ manifests itself in him. So he is a perfect example of someone saying, whatever you want me to do, Father, and the Father in, 19, in the 50s and 60s, we needed him to do social justice. Well, Adam, I, I mean, I'm not going to say a lot because you know that personally you and I go back and forth on this a lot. But I do think that if you look back in just the history of not just America, but the world, most of your world leaders were also spiritual leaders. So it's just really difficult to me, for me to accept. And Sarah agrees. She just wants you to know that. Um, <laughs> it's, just, it's just difficult to accept that now all of a sudden there's supposed to be this line where people who are spiritual leaders don't get involved in worldly issues because if you go back to Dr. Martin Luther and the 99 thesis, um, 95 thesis, if you just keep going back in history, Malcolm X, I mean, all of the people, black no, leaders, no, no, no. leaders. We're not saying they're not supposed to get involved. It's, it's every man, again, this was isolated just to Simon. Is, and that's what I was telling Monique, I just said, it's every, every man is an individual leader. And it meant, like I said, throughout history, every man's calling may lead him to do social justice. This is not to be, a, this thing about social justice was not to be applied. This was just a story of a person who, 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 had, who, who was being asked to surrender to what he was called to do at that time. So no, you're right. So many, I mean, you're right. The list goes on and on about people who had out of their spiritual conviction, they had to step up. They had to step up and protest. Can I give an example of <laughs> uh, Raphael Warnock, who is running for, I guess, senator here in Georgia. I just moved to Georgia last week, but uh, he's the pastor of Ebenezer. And um, the other day, or, well, maybe a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to um, him speaking and he had quoted something from T.D. Jakes and he said, if you can fulfill your vision in this lifetime, then you're dreaming too small. Mm. 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 That was good. But no, Daniel, we are in agreement. Daniel, we are in agreement. I, again, I'm, I maybe not be stressing it enough, but every when you the idea is that when you are when you're responding to the spirit, it is whatever the spirits need to be. And some spirit may say different leaders are called. But this in this particular passage, what Jesus was saying is, do not. He was telling them in his mission and what he was here to do and what the focus of his thing was was to reveal the father in this gospel and that it was a spiritual mission. And he was saying, as it says, he says up here, these things are good. Let me go back and, see, and, and, and read that quote where it says, um, he says, we must be dedicated um, and we must not immediately concern ourselves, but with the representation, will and character of the divine father who stands at the head. And it says, uh, he says, he, it says, Jesus told Simon it was proper to want to see social, economic, and political orders improved. But he always add, this is not the business of the kingdom of heaven. And so, he, again, he's saying it is good. He's just, he's making sure that Simon understood there's a distinction between here's the kingdom of heaven. Don't look to see that kingdom of heaven manifest on the earth, right? And one thing that the Urantia is very clear on also addressing is how the, the, the religions, and individuals who have sought to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth, it always creates some type of chaos of war, right? Because what you're, you're trying to now force, you're going to force these higher principles, you're going to force these higher values on people. This was the Muslims, Islamic Jew, jihads. Their idea was we got to bring God's order to the earth. And Jesus understood the fruit of that, that what that happens. That was the Crusades. So this idea is saying, don't mistake the kingdom of heaven with trying to improve. There's a kingdom of heaven, 
that you live. And then on the side of that, you let that ministry, you let that outflow serve and you do what you can to change. And in the, in the book of Uranus, he gives practical examples. And there's a stories of Jesus doing it when he traveled around. He actually, he gave, he set laws. He, he disputed for people. He helped improve people, nations and progress. So it's an outflowing ministry, but it's not that we're trying to bring that perfect kingdom of heaven that can't be the goal of on this earth in this one short time because it's going to it's going to cause force i'm not par i'm not rehashing it right but the urantia goes into this his history of the individuals or religious leaders who did get who do get caught up in thinking we're going to force the, the the kingdom we're going to force the spiritual rule on earth instead of letting people just hey i'm gonna do good where i can do good at but I'm not going to force. I'm not going to. I'm not going to force the kingdom. That's 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 what leads to the crusades. That's what leads to the jihads. They're trying to force. They interpret their religion, their spiritual values, as needing to happen in the physical world right here and right now today. No, that's a good point. I, I mean, you're you're making a good point. I mean, you know, you're, you're making a good point. I understand. But 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 no, I, I think if you bring I'm it up, and highlighting it because there are there are moments. Martin, like I said, Martin King is such a good example. He was a person. Martin Luther was a, a good example. Oh, no, I mean, I I'm just really concerned with the passivity that I see in a lot of different spiritual groups, like whether it's Christianity or New World Religion or whatever you you may ascribe to, is this like passive? Oh, I'm just going to just love and be in my world but i'm not going to engage so that to me is like it's a fine line to saying that and then talking about the kingdom because jesus was very much involved you know like when he had to pay taxes he paid his taxes he paid his disciples taxes he made sure that he participated and you know he honored the sabbath and he honored the cultural traditions as much as he could until it went against what he was until it went against his like he said his um overriding mission um from god but i just get concerned because whether it's in the church or whether it's someone who um you know never steps in the church there just seems to be like this pseudo spirituality of like i'm just gonna stay in my world and my bubble but mm, I'm not going to vote or, yeah, I mean, Black lives matter, but hey, we just got to stay in our, our vein. And I'm, I'm really concerned about that. So, but you know, I can talk about that. And I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, but I again, I would, I, again, and that's a good, these are good things, but again, it really, one of the things that Urantia is really, 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 um, just really prolonged to say, especially from Jesus' point of view, was that it is it is because we all have such different callings and the spirit works us out. You don't we, we don't know yet. It's hard for us to say who should be doing what. Now I know our mind wants to say what well, you, you whether well, they're being too passive, they're being this, but it's just very hard. It is it's very hard. As a, an example in here, um, where um, where Judas felt like somebody wasn't taking wasn't being serious enough um it was nathaniel right um and said and 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 so this is a beautiful quote right here and it says um about nathaniel nathaniel we don't hear a lot about but i'll read it and i'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing it says in many respects nathaniel was the odd genius of the 12. he was a apostolic philosopher and dreamer but he was a very practical sort of dreamer. He alternated between seasons of profound philosophy and periods of rare and droll humor. When the proper mood, he was probably the best storyteller among the 12. Jesus greatly enjoyed hearing Nate Daniel's discourse on things both serious and frivolous. Nathaniel progressively took Jesus in the kingdom more seriously, but never did he take himself seriously. The apostles all loved and respected Nathaniel and he got along with them splendidly, excepting Judas. Judas did not think Nathaniel took his apostleship sufficiently seriously and once had the eternity to go secretly to Jesus and lodge a complaint against him. Said Jesus, Judas, watch carefully your steps. Do not over magnify your office. 
Who of us is competent to judge his brother? It is not the father's will that his children should take should partake only of the serious things of life. Let me repeat. I have come that my brethren in flesh may have joy, gladness, and life more abundantly. Go then, Judas, and do well that which has been entrusted to you, but leave Nathan, your brother, to give account of himself to God. And it said, in the memory of this with other things, long live in the self-deceiving heart of Judas. So I always like this, um, I always like that picture because it spoke to me. It's this idea of what Jesus says. We, we're not able and competent enough to know who's doing what right, who's not serious enough, or who's this or who's doing that. We don't know, right? All we know is they, if they're over there doing that, that's what they need to be doing, right? And so, and so we see that this is a tendency in us. Again, there's not, we're not demeaning so much Judas. We're just seeing there's this tendency to not have this full understanding of, I don't know what Nathaniel was doing, right? But I always find it very interesting how it was Judas, right? Who was saying, hey, I'm gonna I'm call out Nathaniel. I don't think, I don't think he about his business. And Jesus was like, Judas, you, you, you need to be watching yourself. Don't worry about Nathaniel, right? Um, but as it says, you know, he had this look about him where he may not be serious. And so again, he says, who of us is competent to judge his brother? We just don't know. We just want, we just do not know. And one thing about human design, human is learning human design and the, the science of differentiation, it made me eat that in ways I've never ate it. This line right here. It's, it's allowed me to eat this line in ways I never grasped it. We are so different. We are so designed to be so different. We really, we really cannot. We really just don't have the capacity to judge what someone should or should not be doing. All we know is what we're called to do. And like he said, Judas, do well with that which has been entrusted to you, but leave Nathaniel to give account of himself to God. And as we know, that burnt Judas up, that burnt him up inside, gave him one more reason to get revenge. All right. Any final thoughts or comments? Did that kind of did that kind of um, make sense? Yeah, I I want to mention as far as the um you know us doing what we're called to do, it's really knowing what our gifts are, what our talents are, and contributing in that particular way. Like, I feel like that's when we stay in most alignment. We fall out of alignment when we try to do something that we're not called to do something that's not in us because people are all these people are doing this then i need to go out and i need to run and do that when we're in our alignment i feel like that's when the the god flow the god's grace comes to us like for example i have a bunch of girlfriends we talk on a um, zoom every once in a while and majority of them are are caucasian so most of them are white women and when the whole black lives matter started you know they were all like kind of getting on some of their other friends because their other friends aren't out in the streets and doing this and it was weird because i'm in this conversation and it's like you know, as the black person, I have to be the spokesperson of like, oh, your friends need to be out in the streets or whatever, whatever like this. But I actually said to them, well, um, if your other friends are called to like be in the streets and that's what they should do, but I don't think you should necessarily get on them um, if they're not. Because say for example, and I saw on Facebook where this baker, she's a baker, and she made the most beautiful, inspiring Black Lives Matter cookies. Like it just said Black Lives Matter. That is her alignment. That is who she's called to be. That is her talent. She's a baker. She's not a person who's an orator that needs to be yelling in a, in a whatever pool, what have you, bullhorn. That is not, that, that would frustrate her potential and she's not in her God nature. But if she has her cookies and she's out giving, delivering those cookies for those people who are marching, then that is an alignment. And so I gave that example to my friends in a sense of like, and I think that that's with all of us. We get so hyped up of what's going on in the world from our unique 
perspective, our unique talents, our unique, however we're created to be, how can we get in where we fit in? And so I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, and I, and I think that to me, I may be biased here, but I think this is what Jesus was telling Judas, like be entrusted with what you've been given to do, like be entrusted with your, your thing. Um, I think there's a story here in Atlanta and I don't know how true it is, I'm gonna mention anyway, cause that's what I can do in this group. But there's a story about the Bonner brothers, the Bonner brother hair product lo- legacy and just how uh, their father was critiqued during the civil rights era, the civil rights movement of not being involved enough or, and again, I don't know the truth of this, but when I think about, you know, he was, in, he was, he was creating an enterprise in and in a, in a, in a, in a factory that was employing a lot of people. And, his, and in his mind, I think one of his re- rebukes was, this is how I'm, this is my work. This is what I'm here to do, right? And so um, there is this, uh, I remember, so there's these, everybody is, you just don't know. You just can't say what is, you get, it's just hard for us to know, you know? Um, I think about, um, um, uh, this is so unrelated, but it came through me, so I'm gonna say it. I watched a documentary on Elvis, right? And he was telling, he was, he was telling people how much he loved gospel and how he was, he wanted to do, he wanted to transition at one point to do a gospel album, a gospel tour, or something of it. And they said, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you go ahead and do it? He says, because my payroll takes care of too many households, right? It was idea of, of him, he, he said in an interview like, yeah, I could, but I, that was, that's for me, right? But he says, he says, I have a responsibility. He says, I understand. And he went down to say, he understood what, what him performing, how he's performing, how he was feeding. He said, the perspective always stood with me. He heard a person said, no, I'm, I'm what I do this other thing, I take care of other people's households, my background singers and their children, these musicians, these entertainers. So this is why I'm gonna keep singing this way. But yeah, I love to sing gospel, I would other, but I have, he said too many households depend on me to do this other thing. I don't know if that's all related, but it just came to me. All right, so in, in hindsight, again, to bring it back to the presentation, we're talking about the spiritual eye, the spiritual look, the spiritual awareness. One, we can't, it's so hard for us in our human mind to be able to see beyond the material world, beyond the material kingdom, to see the bigger picture, to see the bigger picture of progress, to see the bigger scope of what things are gonna lead to. We don't know, but when we align ourselves in that frequency, one of the things that the frequency gives us, it gives us a spiritual ideal. It gives us a spiritual eye that helps us live in the moment what the Father's will is for us. And whatever that Father will is for us, it may not, we may not see all the fruit of it in this short life. We may not know why we're led to do something, right? The other day I was, I was giving a example about when people follow their strategy and their authority. Your, your strategy and authority may lead you to something that makes no sense to you, right? But in the long run, if you may leave, you may lose your life in that process. But the pride, remember this, let me summarize it up. Progress is the watch word of the universe. So yeah, it may give up you losing, losing your life and forfeiting enjoying that. But generations upon generations may benefit from you doing that one thing that you get no fruit out of it. And remember, the universe is focused on progress. Yes, M.A.K. lost his life. He didn't get to live his dream. His four children were robbed of their father growing up. But a nation was able to be broken from some collective bondage of of uncivil rights, right? So we see that progress is always gonna be the watchword of the universe. And so when you follow the creator's design, you're following the creator's design, not for the sake of progress, for the sake of progress. So don't get caught up in the blindness of, well, I didn't get anything from this. I thought I was following God's will but I didn't get this. I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to get all these abundance and richness. The thing is, are you in alignment? And is your spiritual heart satisfied? And who knows what that's going to lead to, right? When when we finish reading some of the disciple stories, 
the 12 apostles, some of them had no idea what they, what their, how the legacy of their work would lead. They all went in different places, not knowing what the legacy was gonna come and the seeds and the stuff that it led to. And so it is with that frequency does, it puts us in alignment where we won't know the fruit of our labor. We may not see it, we may not get a taste, we may not experience it, but we'll have the inner satisfaction, we'll have the inner peace, we'll have the inner joy of living in our creator design for our life through alignment with that frequency. Final thoughts, questions, comments. What, what, is, what do y'all hear in this for you all today's presentation? I really love the ideal that you talked about the Jesus frequency as uh, truth telling, honestly. And I don't think you can be spiritually aligned with anything unless you are speaking truth to power. So I can connect with that regardless of what people are doing. And I, I didn't get to comment on what Danielle said earlier, but I too have challenge, been challenged by the spiritual community's lack of alignment to a universal truth of love, of inclusion, of all the spiritual things that we talk about. Because I think uh, maybe for a lot of people who are not in traditionally religious paradigms, we can look at these paradigms and see that they're not necessarily connected to that frequency. That truth is not there in the way that it would have been in Jesus' time or in the way that he did things. And so I, that, I know that I personally still struggle with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. So I want to say I love that summary from Monique, um, as usual. And um, I wanted to mention that I appreciate that too, because, um, you know, I started my summary with, I want to be like Jesus so I can get out of this place of judgment um, with, with people. And I, I appreciate, I can't recall right now at this moment what you said, maybe you can repeat that, um, about when we are concerned with what others are doing, um, we are judging them. And that might just be what they're called to do. Yeah. That's all I got. Thank you. It was, it was right here when we were talking about Judas and Nathaniel, where Nathaniel, because he gave this appearance of a dreamer and he didn't take himself serious, Judas looked at him, looked out and said, you know what, I don't like this guy, right? He ain't, he ain't, he ain't serious enough for me. I don't think he should be with us. The irony, right? The irony, right? That Judas is the one saying, he ain't serious enough. I don't like him. And so much so that he went to Jesus. He goes and said, I'm, I'm gonna go talk to Jesus about Nathan. I, I don't think Jesus is aware. Let me, let me make Jesus aware. Let me hit Jesus. To, to what Nathaniel really is. And he says, hey, hey, brother Judas, watch your steps. Don't over magnify your office. Who's competent? Who is competent to judge his brother? And we see this line throughout in the, even the gospel. Paul says, we cannot judge another person's master. I don't know. He said, you can't judge another person's servant. I don't know what that master told that servant to do. I can't go and say, yeah, you ain't doing right. I don't know what your servant master told you to do. Oh, so Adam, that leads me to ask this question though. So, so um, that goes into my human design, of, you know, looking for basically a reason or answer to not associate with this person anymore um, because I have created all these reasons um, which are in, you know, truth judgments. Um, so my question kind of is, so when you get in a space where you maybe you don't disagree with someone else's truth, um, do you just like not hang around them anymore? Or, you have you know? to ask yourself and ask the Holy Spirit what is correct, what is the Father's will for you? What's the strategy and authority say? Oh, okay. Should you let this person go? Do you need to remove yourself from them? Or is this someone you need to deal with? Right, look, Judas was ready to, Judas was ready to, let's get rid of Nathaniel, right? I don't like him. I don't like nothing about him. I don't feel right about him. But what if, so then, okay, so if, if this is something you've maybe been dealing with for quite some time and, you know, progression is the watchword of the universe and you have not noticed progression, is that, in fact, you know, a, uh, you know. It, it, um, all, it all comes down to it don't matter. It, what matters is, is your inner spirit, is the spirit leading you in the Father's will to disassociate yourself from that person or not? Okay, Adam. Okay. Okay. Better question be what is the most unconditionally loving thing to do? 
That could be it too. But, but I, I, I would always say, you know me, Nicole, you know these days I'm on this strategy and authority. An unconditionally loving thing could be to say, I can't contact you anymore. It wouldn't be good for either one of us. Or it could go the other way where you counsel them in a new understanding. See, or, or, I feel like I'm joining the frequency by continuing to be in this space is the thing. You, it is Well, it, you got to ask yourself, if you feel that way, it go back to what is the spirit leading you in your authority to make your decision to do? All right. I got it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I know that's not the answer you wanted, but I'm, I'm, you know my soapbox these days is strategy and authority, baby. All right. What else? What's the final thoughts for the rest of you all? What are y'all here? What are y'all in here today? What are you hearing this presentation for yourself today? I just hear that there's work to be done. There's more classes to attend. <laughs> more thoughts to be done. I would love to hear you talk to universal truth though. Universally true, things that we know to be universally true outside of all religion, because there are ways to respond to people. I find in this era of people not wearing masks, not believing in science, questioning every little bitty thing, it's difficult to have a conversation about universal truths. Mm, okay. Okay. All right. Adam, it was nice to be on the call. The kids are saying hi in the back. They miss you, Uncle Adam. I'll see them soon. Adam, Love y'all. Last, oh. last time on the call, you said you were coming to, to come see us. I, I'll see y'all soon. Uncle Adam, love you, and I enjoyed the call. And nice meeting all of you guys, and I look forward to um, coming in again. Bye, Daniel. Love you. Thanks for joining. Love you, D. Answer the call. Answer the call, D. Oh, for sure. <laughs> all right. Anybody else? Final thoughts, comments to add? What's what's in here for them today? Thank you so much, Adam. This is a pleasure as always. Um, that's all I have to say. Okay. I enjoy right. everyone, everyone's comments. It always fuels me up. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, Adam. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tiffany. All right, well, everybody, thank y'all so much for participating. This was a free class. If y'all want to share your love and participate, you can cash at me at Adam from Adam. Um, if you would like to, um, I really, I, again, I really have enjoyed this. Um, my cash app is Adam from Adam, or you can PayPal me at Adam Melvin is at gmail.com. I will look forward to being back here next Sunday. All right. I love you all. I don't forget, go ahead and don't wait for me, but y'all can jump down in that book of Urantia book is free it's a free app on your phone the bookie ranch is a free app on your phone or you can go to the website and do it for free um and start reading the life and teachings of jesus all right love you all good night everybody